Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank uh, you guys for inviting me to share um, this talk to you this evening. So we will be talking about antiviral immunity for 30 minutes. Um, so this is very timely because uh, everyone, everyone now is really so aware and uh, very conscious enough of what's happening around the world. So, uh, well, we're not only talking about um, COVID-19 here, but we will be talking about uh, the immune system as a whole. Uh, it's just that we'll be focusing a lot on COVID-19 because this is such a deadly virus, but there are a lot of viruses around us as well. Um, and then uh, we will be linking this uh, talk uh, to lifestyle uh, choices that everyone can do, everyone can start off doing. Uh, in order to increase our immune system. And uh, not to forget as well, the presence of the lifestyle diseases that we uh, have that are coexisting with the current COVID-19. So, um, uh, you know, everyone uh, right now is, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think that uh, uh, the number of deaths uh, with heart disease, with diabetes, and other, and other chronic diseases will be as high as the past year because uh, as the year has started uh, in 2020, uh, we've heard about COVID-19 increasing already, uh, starting off in, in China. And then it started with, uh, it entered other, other countries as well. And if you notice people right now, they are more health conscious than ever. So people now are practicing healthy lifestyle. Everyone is reading. Everyone is educating themselves. How can they, uh, how can they live healthily so that they can get rid of the, uh, of the virus? Okay, so uh, that's one good thing that is in fact happening. Okay, so let's go proceed with uh, antiviral uh, immunity. So we know very well that. Everyone is afraid of coronavirus. This is a new respiratory disease. Uh, science is still studying it. Uh, you know what the, the symptoms uh, are. Uh, if you have um, attended the lectures from uh, Dr. Dr. Gayares, she talked about COVID-19 as well. Uh, symptoms usually appears uh, two to 14 days after the exposure. Classic symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath, diarrhea. Of course, body malaise is also um, noted. So the spread is through the droplets. So that means whenever you sneeze, whenever you cough out, whenever you talk, uh, you can spread the virus if you are uh, infected. Okay, But uh, the World Health Organization is uh, starting to... Um, saying right now that it can be airborne, uh, say for example, if this is in the hospital or in closed um, spaces. So uh, if you notice before, they were not advocating the use of um, um, mask, but this time, uh, you know, everyone is now expected to use the mask and they are advised to use the mask just uh, for us to have extra protection. Okay, so if you look at the slide that uh, you have now in your screen, um, this is in fact the lessons that we have learned from, from China. You know, uh, this, uh, this report was submitted to the World Health Organization. So they already learned something from, from coronavirus, from COVID-19 to be exact. So in, in China, you will notice this is the number of deaths per age. And if you notice, people who are dying, uh, who are infected of this virus is about aging 50 and over. So for, uh, for those who are aging 44, 40 below, um, most of them are surviving if you look at the uh, if you look at the slide right now. So uh, patients aging above and above 80, uh, you will notice that the death rate is higher. Please take note of those ages because as you will see 40, 49, uh, a little bit of um, statistics and a little bit of fatality here. But as the age uh, goes higher, the death, uh, the death rate increases. Okay, um, and in this next slide, you will see that, uh, and we will be focusing much on this because as you would notice, um, patients who are developing into fatality are in fact patients who already have pre-existing conditions. And uh, most of them have cardiovascular disease. Number two here is diabetes, patients with chronic respiratory disease, abnormal high blood pressure and cancer. And only 0.9% of those who died have no pre-existing condition. So we have to take note that 
even uh, in, in communicable diseases right now, you will see that patients who are suffering from non-communicable diseases or the NCDs are the ones who are also at risk of dying from the communicable disease. So that's how important it is to take care of our body, not just for the, for the virus, not just to, to boost your immune system for, for communicable disease, but to establish your immune system and to establish your, your total health and, uh, uh, and overall health, uh, you know, just because uh, it's not only affected the communicable disease, but the non-communicable disease as well, okay? Um, so uh, if you notice, majority of the infections are mild, uh, but it's just that uh, fatality is getting higher in the Philippines uh, uh, specifically, and that frontliners are being affected. And then this is really very quick, you know, the, the virus is acting so quick in, in the body. That's why this is happening now uh, all over the globe. So we are in a, in a some, some countries are in a total lockdown. Some of us are at, the, at a community quarantine just because we wanted to flatten the curve. Um, now what's happening inside the body is that, let's go straight here, when the virus enters the body, actually we have um, the cilia, you know, these are hair-like projections uh, in our lungs that are supposed to be expelling those uh, virus that may come in the body or, or, other, um, or other foreign body that's coming in, in the lungs, so that's a protective mechanism. But the problem is, unfortunately, coronavirus targets the cilia. They damage the cilia. And then eventually they slough off. When they slough off together with the debris and then together with the fluid. So that causes um, the cough and then eventually uh, the pneumonia. Okay. Um, here, uh, you will see that uh, when the virus is, in, is already uh, damaged uh, by, the, by the virus, they can easily uh, get through. Uh, the terminal portion of the lungs, okay? So when they get through the terminal portion of the lungs, so that's the time they can infect um, the alveoli, okay? So when they infect the alveoli, you will see that the body has the immune response, okay? So this happens in bacterial infection, this happens in viral infection. So whatever type of infection, the first line of defense in, of, you, of the human body is the innate immune response. So when we say first line of defense, this includes the monocytes, this includes the natural killer cell as well, and then the phagocytes. Okay, so uh, those are the key uh, immune cells that you have to take note and you have to read more about them because in the next coming slides that we will be talking about, there are so many lifestyle choices that will decrease the number of natural killer cells, that will decrease the number and function of your monocytes, and that will affect our immune response, okay? Now, uh, we also have the adaptive immune response. Uh, just to go back on the first slide, um, the innate immune, immune response, uh, again, they quickly, uh, they quickly respond to whatever invaders may be. It could be the virus. They, easily, they can easily kill the virus even without, uh, without uh, initial encounter with them. They can be, uh, it can be through cytotox cytotoxicity, or they can do a lot of things. Um, so this is the first line of defense. Just before um, the adaptive immune response set in, you know, because sometimes it takes uh, it takes few days and sometimes few weeks before adapt adaptive response um, can set in, okay? So that's why it's really important for us uh, to have a very good innate immune response. We have to take care of our first line of defense. So I keep on saying that, um, yeah, the frontliners are the doctors, but they are just the second defense. Our first line of defense is our immune system. So we have to take care of our, of our immune system. Okay, so this is a, a very nice video that I got from uh, CDC. Uh, if you see here, this is the coronavirus and you will see the RNA uh, in the virus. And uh, that's why uh, they can easily replicate. So what they do, this is in the alveoli. They have, uh, they figure out how to attach into the receptor of the alveoli and then they are able to infect the cell. Now, when the cell is infected, you will see here that is the natural killer cell, okay? So if you see, um, the natural killer and the killer T cell right there um, 
holding the infected cell, uh, this is the first immune response that's happening. Okay, so you will see that infected cell right there. There are a lot of virus there. And then this natural killer cell and killer T cell are actually preventing this, um, uh, this infected cell to burst, you know, and so that uh, the, the spread of the virus in the body can be controlled. Okay, so um, here uh, we will be talking about um, factors that may disrupt your immune function. So please keep in mind the video that I showed you because we will be talking about the natural killer cell, okay? So uh, here uh, we say that there are a lot of factors that may disrupt our immune system. So first is aging. So you, you saw the statistics I, sh I showed you earlier that uh, the, the extreme ages are really affected, specifically those who are elderly. Of course, malnutrition, uh, which includes low potassium, and then um, chronic disease, patients who have pre-existing conditions, like we mentioned, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and then, of course, patients who are having undesirable lifestyle. So it includes diet and nutrition, patients with sedentary lifestyle, patients who are people who have physical and mental stress, people who have problems with sleep, and people who are into alcohol and cigarette smoking. So let's go quickly. Now you will see here uh, that uh, aging really affects um, the immune system, the immune response in particular, and then the number of immune cells in particular. Now you will see here that uh, as we age, there is always a problem with, immune, with immunity. You will see that there is a loss of adaptive immunity with a bias towards the innate immunity. So that's so that's why uh, elderly peoples are really prone to having inflammation. So they have inflammation uh, in many parts of their body. So this fosters inflammatory disease. That's why they are uh, at higher risk of developing fatality whenever they are infected by um, the virus. So uh, and then what's happening is they lost the immunoinhibitory capacity. So that's why sometimes the immune cells can over react and then there would be too much inflammation that may happen which is uncontrolled so that happens in aging okay so please take note that uh, in aging it's not only the age basing on your chronological um, records so that means uh, you may be 45 years old right now basing on your birth certificate or basing on the passport that you're using but biologically your age can be higher Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is people who are indulging into faulty lifestyle may age faster than those people who are into healthy lifestyle. So what am I, what am I uh, trying to say you here is that if you notice um, in the data that we are receiving right now coming from the Department of Health, coming from the World Health Organization, there are patients who are recovering age 95, age uh, age uh, 75, age 80, they are recovering from, from COVID infection, but we have deaths uh, at age 45, and you will see they have diabetes. Uh, okay, a patient died at age 38, but this patient um, may, had initial attack, had initial, um, uh, what do you call, ischemic heart attack, or, or some of these patients may already have pre-existing conditions. Now, uh, the lesson here is that you may be only age 44, but your biological age may be higher just because we are aging faster because of the faulty lifestyle that we have, okay? So it's not only the elderly that we have to take care of. We also have to take care of patients who have pre-existing conditions because they are, both of them are in the same risk of developing fatal condition. Okay, so um, here uh, let's go straight to training program for immune health. So this is easy. Uh, it entails no medication and please take note, even if you take some supplements, uh, they cannot replace the function of the immune system. Okay, in, um, in battling uh, with, with, the, with the viral infection or any bacterial infection. So you have to strengthen your immune system by the following techniques diet and nutrition, physical activity, mental health, and sleep. We reserve supplement for patients who are not able to take all needed nutrients by mouth. So you will know patients who are not able to take them by mouth. So like, for example, these are elderly patients, there are denture problems, so on and so forth. And that's the time we give patients supplementation. Okay, so um, let's go straight here. Okay. 
um, let's, let's, let's go straight with um, this questionnaire here uh, in with regards to diet. Let's start off with diet. So first, are you eating more processed than fresh foods? These are the questionnaires that we have to take note in this, uh, in this time of quarantine uh, because uh, a lot of people are into processed food right now. Of course, fresh foods are still available. Uh, are you eating more red meat than variety of vegetables? Are you missing something important in your diet? Or do you really... Uh, do you routinely miss your breakfast or do you make poor snack and dessert choices routinely or do you eat late at night and then lastly do you keep yourself hydrated with water or more on or more on processed drinks okay so because a lot of people now are staying at home um, they go to the groceries whatever they buy from the groceries they stock it at home and then whatever is available uh, that's what they eat uh, so these are just uh, some of the questionnaire that we have prepared that maybe you can go through this every single day. Okay, so uh, uh, you know we know very well that there is always modulation of immune function just uh, with the food um, that we are eating. Okay, so this is what the study uh, suggested. Uh, these are the foods that may decrease immune function. So basically the meat products, because they disrupt um, the microbiome primarily in the, in the uh, gastrointestinal system and the colon in particular. And then specifically if these are processed meat um, products. We may have a separate um, discussion about the, the meat products and the microbiome because that is a long discussion. Okay, but uh, this, um, uh, this will promote um, this will promote inflammation and so it's not being advised, okay? So apart from the process, uh, from the meat products, uh, we also include here ultra-processed foods, okay? Because they are the drivers of metabolic disease. So a lot of studies would suggest whenever we consume ultra-processed um, food, uh, that always includes sugar, salt, fats, and additives. And of course, they will drive um, metabolic disease. Um, and, and that's uh, self-explanatory, okay? All right, so, but uh, on the other hand, these are the food that are capable of improving our immune, uh, our immune functions. Uh, in fact, uh, if we're eating only whole food, plant-based diet, then we don't have, we won't have problem. Uh, but it's just that pe people right now are consuming more of the processed food than the, than the whole food. Okay, but uh, I'm just happy. Uh, I'm just happy in this season because uh, more people are starting to appreciate, uh, you know, uh, consuming uh, vegetables, consuming whole food, and then learning how to prepare food. Just because they have more time to prepare now. Okay, so uh, you know, I'm really, I'm also happy because uh, if a person can only. Uh, serve like whole food plant-based for them and then for their family for for the next two weeks that we have left for the quarantine then they will be able to train their taste buds they will be able to uh, to change their taste buds that after the quarantine you know they everyone would appreciate uh, the taste of whole food plant-based diet and then when they take the whole meat again the appreciation is not as much you know, before, before the quarantine because the taste buds are changing. So now going back here to the food that are capable of improving immune function, of course, we need the vitamins and we need the minerals. And also we need the probiotics if they're available. And then of course, we need the amino acids. These are the, the, uh, the substances that are needed by our immune cells, you know, to, uh, to increase and to boost their function. So where do we get them? Of course, we get them from food. Again, like I said, we reserve the supplements for patients who, who were not able, who cannot take them by mouth. Okay, so vitamin A rich food, you have all the following sources. Vitamin C, you can get a lot of sources from the foods around. Uh, vitamin E as well. You can get selenium rich uh, food. Uh, you can get them from seeds. You can get them from spinach, from mushroom. You can find them in oatmeal. And then we also have foods rich in zinc. Uh, so there are uh, ongoing studies right now uh, that uh, patients infected with COVID are given zinc uh, uh, as, as a supplement uh, in the hospital. And then the probiotics, if they're available. Now, 
Uh, there are also um, foods that are rich in glutamine. These are the amino acids I'm, I, that I listed earlier, the arginine. This is also one of the amino acids. Okay, so uh, to make it simple, uh, this is the power plate uh, that was organized by the PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Now, in this time of uh, pandemic, this is the best plate that we can use, okay? The power plate. So whenever you eat, uh, just make sure to create a landscape on your plate and then look at it, prepare the plate. And then just before you eat, you prepare all the, all the food that you wanna consume and then put them on the plate and look at it uh, this way. So portion of that should be fruits, the grains, legumes, and vegetables. Now, people may ask, where do we put fish? Where do we put the meat? Where do we put the chicken? So on and so forth. So maybe you can include them in the legumes. Maybe you can include them in the vegetables. But as, as you can see right there, uh, the main portion of those plates are supposed to be filled up with whole food plant-based diet. So if we are talking about anti-inflammatory diet, if we are talking about immune boosting diet, then this should be the composition of our plate. Okay, so next we have um, physical activity. Okay, so we know that exercise has the capacity to protect and even enhance uh, the immune system. Uh, so we only need about 30 minutes of aerobic uh, exercise, five days per week. Uh, so, and this is ideal for the immune system already. So please take note that even if we need physical activity, excessive exercise may be deleterious to immune system. It will, it will uh, decrease the function of the immune system because that is excessive exercise is also considered as physical stress, okay? So you might be asking how do we get exercise when you're always staying at home? There are a lot of things that you can do. Gardening is also considered as moderate physical activity if that is active gardening. Cleaning your houses, if this is active cleaning your houses, is also considered moderate physical activity. And then you can also look for videos that you can use as guide uh, when you do your physical activity as well. Okay, so there are also elderly who can, whom you can help to to uh, to get uh, to be um, physically active because there are seated exercises that you can follow. Okay, so you can check YouTube because there are um, seated exercises for 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 elderly that is really designed for them, just for them to be active. Uh, there are so many things that we can do at home. So that's not an excuse. So remember that uh, sedentary and overtrained individuals are more susceptible um, to infection. Okay, so again, uh, you can do walking, you can do um, seated exercise. So physical activity is really necessary because uh, we need to have a very good blood circulation. Remember that if you're only sitting, uh, the blood flow is not really that effective. Okay, you need to contract your muscles because that, uh, that helps with the blood circulation so that uh, the white blood cells may circulate effectively and so they can go to places where they are needed. Okay, next is stress management and mental health. So remember, we have the neuroendocrine immunology. And that please also remember that negative emotions from stress can augment inflammatory pathways. So I guess this was already discussed to you by uh, Dr. Dr. Gayares. So just always remember that when you're stressed, cortisol hormone is high, not only the cortisol hormone, but a lot of things in the metabolism are changing whenever a patient is stressed out. Uh, so remember the, uh, our, our immune system, our nervous system and our immune system, they talk together. So that when a person is stressed, the immune system also uh, is lowering, okay? So the immune response is also decreasing. So how do you, uh, how do you manage stress? Uh, this can be one. This can be, this can be one topic, and that's why I, I guess that was already discussed as well. So there are so many things that can that we can do, uh, you know, in managing stress. But let me uh, go through one of the most common thing uh, that is also uh, contributing to to stress, and that is um, poor quality of sleep. Okay, so let's talk about the sleep hygiene because this is so important uh, in terms of talking about the innate immune cells. 
okay? You remember the natural killer cells, okay? You, you remember the monocytes. So whenever you uh, you were not able to sleep the night prior, uh, there are studies that are showing that almost 30% of your natural killer cells are not functioning well. Um, so there is a reduced in number of natural killer cells and there is a reduced function of natural killer cells. So you will notice uh, that um, person who are not having enough quality sleep, they are the ones who have the lowest immunity. Okay, so uh, there are there is the study that uh, would show you that even modest loss of sleep reduces natural immune response. And there are also studies that are showing us uh, that early night sleep is really necessary for us to increase the number of natural killer cells, the number of monocytes and their function. So you might be sleeping eight hours, uh, seven to eight hours at night, but you may be sleeping too late. Okay, so there are studies that are showing that we need to sleep early at night. So maybe nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, we have to be asleep. Okay. Um, so how do we improve um, sleep hygiene? Number one, consistency is the key. Uh, so say you have, we have to train our body. We have to train, uh, train our body clock. So say uh, if, you're, if you want your body to get used to sleeping at 10 p.m. at night, then you have to do it consistently. Okay, so, so we have to train our body clock. Then we have to practice buffering before bedtime to slow down before bedtime. Um, so uh, we have to pull the plug. That means gadgets, screens, uh, exposure to, uh, to blue light. Uh, remember that blue light is, uh, uh, what do you call this? Um, the blue light is interpreted by our, our retina as uh, sunlight. Okay, as daylight. So that means your melatonin are decreasing. Uh, and so the sensitivity of your body to melatonin is also decreasing. So uh, that's why it's really necessary to get rid of, of the screens about an hour before your uh, estimated time of sleep. And then of course, cut down of caffeine and alcohol and we need sunlight exposure specifically in the morning because when you are exposed to, to the sun, specifically our eyes when we're exposed to the sun. And so that is, the, that is actually the signal for our body clock. And then your body would say, this is uh, morning, this is daytime, melatonin will go down. And then that will start counting the number of hours of wakefulness, okay? So next here is, uh, of course, we have to create a sleep, a very good sleep environment. So as much as possible, um, the, the, the bedroom should not be the office. The bedroom should, should not be the eating place. So your bedroom should be a place where you can sleep comfortably, okay? So that you can improve uh, your sleep. All right, so there are other things that we can do. Uh, if we are uh, looking at uh, immune, immune boosting uh, capacity and then whenever a patient is already suffering from, from either mild moderate or moderate symptoms, patient may be starting to cough, patient may be starting to um, have irritation, irritation of the respiratory system, what they can do to start um, is steam inhalation. Okay, so uh, for those who are uh, listening now, uh, I'm sure you're familiar what steam inhalation is all about. This is just introducing moist air into your lungs via the nose and throat for therapeutic benefit. So there are lots of studies that will tell you that this will help you uh, clear the black nose and open the congested sinuses. This will help you breathe easily, and then this will help you excrete the mucus. And there is this very good study uh, that uh, also um, showed that steam inhalation improves the nasal mucociliary clearance. Please remember the initial uh, slide that I showed you earlier that uh, there are, there are uh, in, in a respiratory system, we have the mucociliary clearance that is regularly happening for our, our respiratory system to get rid of viruses, to get rid of foreign bodies. Okay, so steam inhalation can be done. So again, steam inhalation can be done by um, adults. This is, and this can be done uh, in, in elderly and for children as well. So this is only three minutes. You can do this twice a day. You may add mint leaves as desired. So if you have available 
um, fresh mint, then you can also add it to, for soothing purposes. All right, so next here is um, gargling. So a lot of studies are actually um, uh, advising and uh, recommending gargling because this will prevent upper respiratory tract infections. Okay, and then uh, this will also um, attenuate bronchial symptoms, and this is a cost-free modality. So gargling using plain water will already help, uh, but if you prefer warm, uh, then that can be done as well. So uh, you may also add mint or salt uh, if it is uh, desired. Okay, so lastly, uh, steam bath. Um, this is one of the traditional way that people are doing whenever they have infection. So, you know, people before don't, don't really, they are not really sure what are those, uh, what are the causative agent of the infection, whether it be viral, whether it be bacterial, they do steam inhalation, a, a steam bath anyway, okay, uh, because uh, they believe it improves uh, the immune response, they believe that improves the immune system. Uh, because whenever uh, our, our temperature is, body temperature is increasing, the number of our white blood cells are also increasing in production, in response to the infection that your body is um, facing. There are a lot of studies that will tell you um, that uh, increasing body temperature will in fact help uh, patients, you know, to increase uh, the immune response, specifically the initial uh, immune response, okay, which is the innate immunity. So it will improve the number of the and, and function of your monocytes. And of course, this will improve sleep. So that's why we, um, uh, we recommend that you can do steam bath 15 minutes before bedtime. So why do I put steam bath here? In fact, in many studies, you will see dry sauna. But in the Philippines, only the rich people can, can afford sauna bath, okay? Or also what we can do at home is a steam bath. So the purpose here is increasing your body temperature. So if you need um, um, more literature about this, you can also look and visit uh, Healing Wonders of Water because that will give you the, uh, that will give you the, the instructions on how to do, that, to do steam bath. Okay, so as a summary, these are the factors again um, that will disrupt the immune function. So we discuss about aging. So like I said earlier, so please remember that aging does not only count your age based on your birth certificate. It, is, it can also be based on your uh, uh, on the biological function, on your cells, okay? So again, you can be 45 years old, but biologically you can be older. But there are those who are 75 years old, but biologically they can be younger just because they live healthily, okay? And then we also discuss about malnutrition. And of course, we placed emphasis on chronic diseases, diabetes, cancer, and heart disease. Again, this is the best time for patients suffering from non-communicable disease to get rid of these diseases um, for the rest of their life if they can do it. You know, uh, we can't say that cancer can be reversible. We can say that heart, we cannot say that heart disease can be reversed in few months. But there are studies that are showing that yes, it can be reversed, but it will take minimum of 12 months for the for the blood vessel in the heart to reopen again. But there are lots of evidences that will tell you that diabetes can be disarmed that diabetes can be reversed. It really depends on how long you've been diabetic, but there are chances that even patients who are into insulin already, uh, just by getting into intensive therapeutic lifestyle change, they can really be helped, okay? And then uh, lastly, we discuss about the undesirable lifestyle. Of course, uh, we, we uh, talk about the the vitamins, the minerals, the probiotics, and then the amino acids that we need because that is needed by, immune, by your immune cells. Okay, so we also talk about um, being physically active uh, so that we can help our immune, our immune system. And then uh, we also talk about mental stress. And then we also talk about sleep. And then lastly, alcohol and cigarette smoking. So, um, I may not be talking more about alcohol and cigarette here, but uh, a lot of studies are showing you that even any amount of alcohol may disrupt 
the function of our immune cells. And of course, in terms of cigarette smoking, I don't know how to how to do how to say this, but any form of smoke uh, inhaled, including vaping, including smoke coming from uh, coming from roasting, coming from from the things that uh, that we uh, that we cook. Uh, uh, this is roasting that I'm that I'm saying. Then the the lechon, etc. They can uh, they can disrupt the respiratory cilia. Okay, so uh, with cigarette smoking, this is the best time for patients to get rid of cigarettes. All right. So again, so those are uh, those are the factors that may disrupt the immune function. And so if we can, if we wanted to increase our immune response, then we have um, we have to get rid of these things that may disrupt immune function and the number of our immune cells. So again, I wanted to emphasize that the frontliners are the second defense, but the first line of defense is our own immune response. Okay, so you will notice that um, this virus may actually uh, may actually infect. Uh, may actually infect extreme ages, may infect anyone. So our goal here is to increase and boost our immune response by all means, because that is the front line and that is the first defense against virus and that is antiviral immunity. Good evening. All right. Thank you, Dr. Michelle, for that informative talk, protecting and boosting our immune system. Now is the time for us to ask questions. If you have questions for Dr. Michelle, um, you may unmute your mic or you may um, leave a message on our chat box so I may read it. So if you have questions, please do ask now. We'll give this time for question and answer. Thank you again, Dr. Michelle. Welcome. Anyone? Oh, we have questions from Jetro Severino. Doc Mish, good, uh, good evening. How long should we expose our body to sunlight and specific time in the morning? Thanks. So he's asking about how long should they expose their body to sunlight, Doc? And do they ha uh, does it have a specific time in the morning? Okay, so yeah, so uh, with regards to sunlight exposure, uh, you notice it's summertime right now. So the best time to expose ourselves to sunlight is early in the morning. So it really depends on on uh, the time of uh, sunrise, but uh, approximately about six o'clock to seven o'clock. So how long do you expose yourself? Fifteen minutes will do. Okay, uh, you know. Uh, but when you're when you do gardening, sometimes you don't even have to count the number of the number of minutes you expose yourself. So you know, I'm really appreciating what's happening now because a lot of people are in the garden again. So yeah, so 15 minutes of exposure in the sun is really good. But if you can do it in your garden, then that's best. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doc. Um, clarification from Chris Olito Kaliva. You may. And mute your mic if you want to ask questions directly to Dr. Michelle. If you have, if you want some clarification, Crisolito Caliva. Okay. Crisolito, do you want to ask the question or, okay. Um, Uh, he wants some enlightenment, po. If, yeah, he read about the first line of defense is the skin or mucous membranes. Is it the skin or the mucous membranes, po? Okay, so uh, it really depends on where the invaders would land. You know what I mean? So if this is a, a bacterial infection that would land in your skin, then of course the first line of defense would be your skin. And in your skin, uh, we have the immune cells right there as well. When you say mucous membrane, uh, that would be in the eyes, in your nose, uh, in your respiratory mm -hmm. system, okay? So they are totally different structures. 
So like, for example, if the virus or the bacteria will, will get into the mouth, then the first line of defense would be your, your, your the, the first line is, of course, your mucous membranes. But if uh, those um, biological agents would drop in your skin, then the first line of defense would be your skin. Okay. So Lito, I hope you were clarified about that. Now, another question, um, Doc, how long um, does our body can recover from one day late night sleep? All right. So how long can our body will recover? If we can turn back time, then maybe we can recover. So that means if you weren't able to sleep the night prior, uh, you can't turn back time anymore. So all you can do, because uh, a lot of us would say uh, uh, we may not be uh, we, can, we didn't have enough sleep last night, so I have to sleep like uh, more tomorrow or the following day, right? So that is what we call recuperating, but you cannot turn back time anymore. So you disrupted the immune function already, you disrupted the function of the cell uh, that night prior. And so what you can do is to recuperate. So if you uh, are asking like how many days, now studies are showing that this could be about three days to seven days, depending on the recuperation time that you may be in or depending on the stress that you're exposed to during those time as well, or depending on the activity, whether we are, we are well rested of the day after or not. Okay. Doc, there's a follow-up question about the sunlight exposure. How about the afternoon sunlight, like 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. sunlight? Yeah, of course. Uh, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. sunlight is also good. Um, it really depends on the sunset again. So if you're comfortable of going out uh, in the afternoon, because again, during summer, it's still hot at 4 and 5 uh, you, you can you can you can uh, appreciate uh, coolness around 6 p.m. already. Uh, so if if um, patients uh, has the and has the risk to develop uh, you know patients or hypertensive already, then we don't really recommend them to go out to have sunlight exposure when it's still hot, just because it's summertime right now. But again, if you're comfortable about 4 p.m. 5 p.m., that's not a problem. But like I noticed right now, every summer, 4 and 5 p.m. is still hot. So that's why 6, uh, 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. is really nice uh, during summertime. All right. I think we have last question here. Um, for patients who are already positive of coronavirus, can they apply the same principle, principles such as steam inhalation, etc.? Yes, of course. They can still do it. Uh, okay, so remember, if these patients are already infected, then they have respiratory symptoms. So they may have colds, you know, they may be coughing. Again, uh, like what we presented earlier, if you do steam inhalation, then that will help you unplug your, your sinuses, then that will help you excrete the, the mucus that you have to excrete, and that will help you with, uh, with uh, the breathing as well. So steam, steam baths, steam inhalation, and gargling, of course, it will help them. All right. So again, thank you, Doc. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing to us your knowledge. 